a filler lecture um, that links together Goffman, who we're going to view for the rest of the semester as a Durkheimian social theorist. That means that he's someone who isn't really an interactionist, who uh, essentially argues that, you know, we make social life in the moment. Uh, we sort of improvise social life. We actually, from here on, are going to view Goffman primarily as a theorist of social structure and um, sort of social structure in modernity. So we're going to be linking Goffman up to the other theorists uh, of the, um, you know, that we cover in, 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 in my sociological theory courses. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at uh, three topics. The first one is Goffman's deference and demeanor, and we're going to be emphasizing the uh, projection of superiority and uh, inferiority in, in uh, these interaction rituals. Once we get that established, we're going to be making the argument that the masks from Goffman's uh, uh, early work uh, wind up becoming mirrors. And then that links us into Hegel's work, um, and, and that's where this goes eventually, is into Hegel. We're going to take a slight detour through the distinction between values, social values, ideal values, in, um, in, in, in Bogle's terms, and, and economic value. So we're going to be trying to link together a sociological theory, the concerns that most sociologists have had from sort of the beginning of, of, um, of the discipline forward, and we're going to be comparing and contrasting that to Marx's use of the word value. And so we're going to be trying to see how, how uh, the economy is always also social. And we're going to, do, uh, we're going to look at, at an example of a society that privileges social values over value. They're going to be making the comparison to our society that privileges value over social, uh, sort of what we would think of as moral, moral value. But more on uh, value is more on that as we go. Then we're going to wind up by walking through uh, a very, very quick version of Hegel's dialectic of, ma of dialectic of master and slave, a again with kind of an emphasis upon the mirror function and the way that 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 modern society uses commodities. That commodities uh, sort of emerge as an important uh, mediator in the uh, mutual recognition um, in in modern society. So in other words, we don't look at each other directly. We now look at each other. At refracted or ricocheted off of the um, of the commodity um, or money or even capital itself. So more as we go. So there's the three things. Number one, Goffman's deference and demeanor. Number two, value values distinction. And number three, uh, uh, Hegel's uh, phenomenology of spirit, the master slave dialectic, primarily. Okay. So really faster. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to see if this can come. Yeah, there it is. You can see this. Mirrors are really weird things. So I said earlier that I think masks are kind of weird. I also think mirrors are weird. And, you know, when you look at a mirror image, it, 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 it appears to me like it's right here, like right where my finger is touching is where my image is. But of course, it isn't there at all. And it's actually, it, it, visually, it seems like my image is twice the distance from myself to the mirror. It's way over there on the other side. But in the end, it's actually nowhere, right? It's just a weird, a weird thing. So it's a kind. Of, they play all kinds of visual tricks with this, or on us. Jacques Lacan, uh, writings on the mirror stage and later writings, especially in some of his his lectures, makes so much of mirrors and the mirror function, how mirrors operate, right? They're freaky things. They're they really are uncanny, and in, in in sort of the Freudian sense, right? They seem. They, 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 that the image that we see in the mirror is us, and yet it's not quite us, right? That kind of thing. So, so anyway, more on that as we go. So mirrors are weird. Uh, they creep me out almost as much as, as clowns do. Okay. So, um, okay, so that's what we're doing. So let's, let's begin then. Um, I'll try to sort of walk us through this as fast as possible. All right, so Goffman's work, we talked um, in, in my undergraduate class, at least, about uh, the presentation of stuff in everyday life. And I'd like to now go into a little bit more depth about his uh, essay, Deference and Demeanor, from the book Interaction Ritual. So his argument here is that, um, is that the mask that humans wear is completely virtual. It is made out of nothing more than other people's behavior, okay? In other words, the only way I know that my, ask is, my mask 
is realized is in the behavior of other people who alter their conduct in accordance with the self that I am hopefully projecting out, right? But what Goffman tells us in Deference and Demeanor is that the power to project a self actually lies fully on others and that we have no capacity actually to project our own self. It has to be projected onto us, right? So let's talk about this really quickly. So Goffman is sort of arguing in this book that, that you know, sociologists from Durkheim on have, have viewed sort of ritual as the way that we honor uh, social values, especially things like gods or totems, that we engage in these highly elaborate, highly scripted, very sort of energy intensive, right? They're, they're, it takes a lot of energy to do a ritual, careful conduct, careful dress, and so on. Formulaic, you don't want to get anything wrong, you're going to unleash a demon, that kind of thing, right? So they're very labor intensive things. And he argues that in the modern world especially, we, pro we actually engage in everyday life in something called interaction rituals, which means that we're not worshiping gods in everyday life. We're actually generating with ritual conduct these little tiny godlike things, spiritual things called persons or selves. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a different argument than in, in presentation of self in everyday life where the individual actor is projecting out and animating a role. Here, other people are absolutely crucial for projecting onto us, right, the self that is uh, socially viable or socially real. So we're going to find there's a parallel here to Marx's concept of value, uh, um, that, that it has to be recognized in society or, 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 or it disappears. Okay. So, um, so interaction rituals are these little sort of, uh, you know, heavily scripted, energetic uh, um, behaviors that s we engage in in society where we worship or realize selves or persons, right, rather than gods. So it's the, it can be as simple as that, as that hello, goodbye, nice to see you, how are you doing today, those kind of small little, again, the small coins of social life. Or it can be much more elaborate. In the book, in the article Deference and Demeanor, Goffman argues that, that what we wind up doing, the main thing that we're doing, and in, it's in addition to sort of defining the self that we are, is that we're actually projecting outward um, uh, deference towards other people, and they are projecting onto us. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of a lonely status. In, in other words, they're accepting um, um, the the uh, deference of other people. So really fast. So Goffman argues that that most social relationships are actually not egalitarian or equal, but are actually uh, that there's some subordination built into them, and that the way that that subordination is made real is through uh, again the alteration of conduct. So it generally begins with a uh, with the person who's subordinate, who energetically displays um, a deference towards someone else. So to defer is to literally alter your conduct, to defer. You you actually detour almost, or 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 uh, 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 divert your action. Um, so you don't accomplish your end that you're focused upon doing, right? You actually are, are diverting yourself, right, into a ceremonial display. That's, that is as ritualistic as the kind, again, this is sort of like a, like, like a prostration move where one lays oneself down, which is the ultimate show of subordination. I was raised Catholic, the movement of genuflection, when you get down on a knee as you enter and face the altar, that kind of thing has that same function or the kind of ritual courtesy of extending a hand, of looking at someone, the old fashioned bowing, the old fashioned curtsy, uh, that kind of thing, right? So you're, you're diverting your attention away from the accomplishment of instrumental ends in order to accomplish these ceremonial displays of personhood. But you're not so much displaying your own person, but you're actually animating and energizing the other person's person, right? So, so the other person's self. So, so the person who's in a subordinate position here defers to someone who is then 
maintaining demeanor, displaying demeanors that they're ritually uh, sort of receiving uh, the subordination. So the, the, so the subordinate essentially projects out, I'm not worthy, I am not worth as much, more about that as we go on, that's going to be a key term. Worth, by the way, essentially means to bend or to, again, kind of divert so that it, 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 and it, and in extreme form, it means to actually lay down or to die. So worth really refers to, um, you know, something like worship literally means to bend, to lay down, to make oneself um, entirely subordinate, that kind of thing. Um, and then the person, the superior, uh, receives the deference uh, you know, you may be recognized, I recognize you because I receive your deference, I'm giving you a social role, right? So the person who defers essentially projects out the demeanor and the superiority of the sub superordinate or the superior. And by displaying demeanor, the acceptance of other people's deference, the superior person projects out and recognizes the deference of the other. So in other words, each of the two people here, right, are functioning essentially as mirrors for each other so that I cease, I can't see myself, right? I can't essentially energize my own self. I can only energize myself as refracted off of the other. I can't be a subordinate unless the superior recognizes me as such. That's a weird way to put it, right? We don't think of it that way. We often think of it the other way. I can't be superior unless other people recognize me as such, right? So unless others recognize my superiority through deference, I'm not superior, right? And that kind of jealousy or, or uh, uh, of, of other people's uh, deference is something that you often see in, in um, you know, tin tyrants or people who are kind of insecure, right? They really want people to bow down before them. So there it is. So the ritual acts of regard and of prostration that the subordinate engages in, um, again, makes the superior knows, essentially, right, that they become a mirror where the superior can see their superiority, the self that's superior. And the subordinate is able to see in the superior's acceptance of their subordination a self out there, right? So, it, it, so the self appears to be out there and it's reflected back at the, the person as a result of it. Strange. Okay, so, so, so you get this sense of mutual recognition that the subordinate can only come into existence, be realized in the recognition of the superior, and the superior can only be recognized in the, um, in, in, in the, in, in the conduct of the, of the subordinate, right? So you wind up in this with this strange mutuality that even positions, and maybe even especially positions, that have, that have um, super and subordination built into them that are hierarchical, there really is a kind of mutuality to it. And so, um, so mutual recognition then is necessary to realize selves. That selves, again, aren't actual masks. And even if they were masks, the person animating that self, that mask, couldn't see whether it's effective or not or real or not. They can only see it in the distortion in the social world of social networks when you see the other people behaving in a particular way. I only know I'm superior and effectively superior if others subordinate themselves to me. I only know that I'm subordinate if when I behave in a subordinate fashion, the superior uh, uh, accepts it, right? Okay. Um, and then even in, in, in situations where you have equal status and equal honor, um, there still has to be that kind of ritual recognition, mutual recognition, right? So, so, so the argument is, is that none of us have the ability. So here, here's the big points, right? That human beings are fundamentally social, that the self that we're animating at any given time comes to us from others, that we cannot give ourselves deference, right? We can't give ourselves recognition. Others must do it. So we can't worship at our own altar. You know, there are no gods that self-worship. All gods depend upon the worship of subordinates of other people, right? I can't worship at my own altar. I can't recognize myself. I can't give myself demeanor. I can't give myself deference, right? It has to come from others. So that means that I can't be a self, I can't ignite a self, I can't be unless other people recognize it. So that means that society then is essentially this long 
um, sort of machine of interaction rituals in which people come into each other's co-presence and then perpetually generate and activate and sustain, and I like the word energize or realize selves, okay? So, um, you know, a friend of mine uh, and, and myself, I sometimes write alone for days and I'll sometimes get sort of hungry for social contact and I'll wind up going out to a coffee shop or someplace just to get a, that kind of little ritual exchange at the counter where someone treats me as a human being. In the age of coronavirus, that doesn't happen so much, but, but, but it energizes the self. One feels like a self when you're recognized as such uh, by others, that kind of thing. So that's one of the things that society is. Society is a massive sort of refractory of mirrors, right? So everyone has a mirror on them, or essentially their face becomes a mirror that other people can see themselves in, and then other people's faces are essentially mirrors in which uh, I, as a self, can see myself in their conduct. So selves and persons are essentially immaterial. They're purely spiritual, no different than a soul, right? More on that as we get deeper in. In other words, they're purely social. So selves are social things, they're spiritual things, they're immaterial things. The masks that we wear are made of something as wispy and thin as, as other people's conduct, okay? It's the only way that we know what we are. Okay, so let's take a look really fast here at, at some images of prostration. So here's some Carmelite nuns who are engaged in ritual prostration, prostration uh, before an altar. So through their conduct of extreme subordination, they are recognizing the superior status of, of God, right? That, they, that they're honoring uh, with their conduct. Here's images of um, ancient, I believe this is like, uh, 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 God, I'm not certain uh, where this is from actually. Uh, but, but anyway, it's, it's an ancient depiction of deference rituals. So when in front of a god or a priest or a superior, a king, one must defer. And so these are these are various deference rituals, right, um, of some kind. I think it's clear in this image from, uh, from Egypt, right, from ancient Egypt. Um, so as one is approaching the pharaoh, you bring gifts, uh, and then you can give these little worshipful moves. You begin to give deference, and the ultimate thing is to actually, you know, get down to the ground, prostrate, straight yourself, kowtow, really, like put your put your face on the ground, right? So that's a display of deference. So it is the conduct of the subordinates that that signals to the pharaoh and to everyone else that the pharaoh is hot, right? Big stuff, right? We must obey this extremely powerful person because of the behavior that they're engaged in. Yeah, so, so, the, 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 so this posture of deference, of prostration, again, it's, 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 an, it's almost like a universalistic signal of subordination, right? Many animals even do it uh, as well, right? And so it is through the expenditure of energy to place oneself in a position of subordination that you signal to the other that you're lowly and they're high. So here again, prostration and deference before an altar. So it's signaling to all that the um, that whatever this is, that the sacred thing that's being uh, prostrated before has social power, and it makes it real and realized. Here's kowtowing, literally, um, um, right, which apparently means, uh, I think it means head touch, right, head touch to the ground, something like that. So here we have soldiers, uh, you know, imperial soldiers essentially coming in, and um, local people, uh, kowtowing, prostrating themselves before, ritually signifying uh, superior status, and and uh, again the demeanor here of recognizing, um, you know, uh, uh, the lower position. So again, the kind of the, the 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 saluting that goes on in the military, uh, back and forth, so on. That that you know that's that's essentially deference and demeanor uh, rituals. Last one that leads us into the next discussion. Um, you know, the Virginia State Seal has um, um, this kind of, well, this one doesn't work as well. Let's use this one. I like this one more. Um, in this Virginia State Seal, um, the tyrant who has been crushed by Lady Liberty here, we've got this, this, this woman soldier uh, here looks almost like mustachioed, anyway, like a mustache, anyhow, but, 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 but the idea is, is that, is that you have this defeat going on, and so the defeated, the vanquished, is in a position of ritual subordination, and the victor is in a position of dominance over them, and so it is, so, so this is important, so we have here the beginnings of a deference and demeanor situation when 
the defeat in battle occurs and it doesn't go all the way to actual murder or death right struggle to the death instead it leads here to this moment when the vanquished looks up and says you know instead of killing me why don't you recognize me as a slave and we'll go from here right okay all right so that gets us through the first part um all right point number two actually i think i set aside right here okay point number two Values and value. So, um, so Goffman is a Durkheimian social theorist. That means that he's dealing with something called social facts, which are sort of visible, sense you know, sensible. We can we we our senses can detect the effects of the things called social, even though the social itself is something that's immaterial, uh, can't be seen. Okay. So Durkheim writes about, about things like, you know, like gods and, 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 and totems and, and religious values and so on. And, and so does Dirk, uh, excuse me, so does Goffman, who writes about persons and selves and, you know, ritual honoring and, and, and profanation uh, to generate something like uh, subordination. So these are social values that, and, 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 um, and this is going to be distinguished from economic values. So Marx, I'm going to tell us, or at least we're going to begin with this, that Marx is dealing with a new thing, a relatively new thing called value, at least the way that it functions, the way that it operates, the way that it, 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 it uh, um, is realized in capitalism, and capital is different than elsewhere. So how do the things that we know of as social values, the things that we're, we care about, and, and, and honor and respect and worship and sacrifice for, how do those compare to this other thing called economic value, right? So we know that we think about commodities as having value or uh, um, objects as having value. We often think of value in money terms in capitalism, right? That's how we think about it. Um, so how do these things relate? Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to use um, um, uh, Bugle's uh, d distinction between ideal values and um, economic value. Um, honestly, the great American sociologist Thorsten Veblen in his book, Theory of the Leisure Class, made this precise distinction in the first two chapters, three chapters of the book, in which he argues that, that most societies everywhere are rooted in something called valor. So values and valor are linked together. So the key term here is val. So let's kind of see, do I have this here? Yeah, right here. So let's jump to val and then we'll come back. So what is val? Well, val, kind of a Nordic term, um, it is fall. So val refers to things that have fallen, are falling, right? So a valley is a depression that's falling. Uh, um, um, uh, um, let me see. Um, Valhalla <laughs> in Nordic myth or in uh, any of the many, many uh, film versions of, of Vikings these days. Uh, Valhalla refers to um, a kind of heaven uh, for those who died honorifically in battle. So if you fell, Val, if you fell in battle honor with honor, right, you could be vanquished and killed. But if you fought with honor, then you will go essentially to the Viking heaven, the hall of the fallen, right? All right, the, fall, the hall of the fallen. I have an image of that, this from, um, from good old Wagner, right? This is a, um, an image of uh, heroes going uh, to Valhalla, right? So, so if you fall in battle, um, you have valor, right? So valor is doubled. The person who dies has valor. And the person who kills also displays valor, right? So the person who dies is now in pure spirit and, 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 and has disappeared into Valhalla, into the heaven of the fallen. But the person who killed, who vanquished them, um, is now in possession of a kind of remnant uh, that they, they somehow bear the valor of the person who died, right? So the, this whole idea is that val refers to falling or to death, to human death. So, so it's the person who has valor was willing to die, put their life on the line, was willing to fight and fought to the death. And the one who fell goes to pure spirit. 
the one who remains, somehow or other has that pure spirit attached to them called valor, right? So we think about val valor, you know, uh, uh, you know, valedictorians, the person who's at the top, you know, we, we, we value them very much, that kind of thing. All right, so social values are always rooted in valor, in, in, in death with honor, warfare, right? In other words, uh, this, this is a moral, ideal, or social thing purely. Uh, to get down here, values are always those things, groups, principles, ideals, gods, totems, uh, you know, for which people are willing to die. And, um, and that's what values are. Values are things essentially we're willing to die for, right? So you know you're dealing with the social value when you're willing to die or others are willing to die for it. Now, value in the economic sense is different. It's rooted in economic exchangeability, in market uh, trade. Um, it requires recognition, right? And usually in money form and contemporary capitalism, although in earlier stages it could be in bartered form. In other words, you can have a relative form of value where you're recognizing the value of one thing in reference to another thing. In our world, we tend to recognize it in forms of money. But this isn't something that, that, that you've died for, you're willing to die for in the same way. The death is different, okay, with economic value. Or as we're going to talk about it, people die by the hour into the production of a commodity that then is exchanged, and the thing it's exchanged for is its value, and so you, someone somewhere died by the hour into the production of that thing that now has been recognized as value. So if I can put it bluntly, the material objects that uh, store values, social values, uh, are things like gods, totems, icons. My favorite term that I write about, uh, uh, trophies. They're trophies. So if you possess a trophy, you're essentially, you have a material bearer of your valor. If you win a trophy in an athletic contest, that is a material bearer of your superiority over other people. So you've shown that you can best other people in battle, right? If you have a medal from, from military, um, uh, uh, you know, from, from, you know, as a warrior, you're doing, it's the same thing. You know, Veblen writes about, you know, literally carrying around the scalp of a defeated enemy or, um, you know, a, a lock of hair from a defeated enemy or the teeth of a defeated enemy or some other body part of the defeated enemy is a trophy. So that it, it that signifies your valor. You killed and that your, your, your power is being born by, carried by that material object. So gods, totems, idols, these are bearers, they're material bearers of death, of, of life that has gone into, um, um, that has been sacrificed, that has been, um, you know, um, um, uh, let's just say, um, expended upon the ceremonial worship of that thing, okay? All right, so, so values, then people are willing to die for them, materially, physically, they're gods, totems, icons, trophies, right? Um, you establish values generally through sacrificial death, um, and they you feed and worship values, gods even, um, um, by um, worshiping, bending, showing respect, deference, right? Um, expending energy, in a kind of ritualistic ceremonial display of, superior, of subordination to this thing that's superior, and it is superior because death has occurred in its uh, production, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm exaggerating here a little bit. But, um, you know, but you're, you're bowing um, when you're worshiping, you're bowing, you're submitting, you're d displaying honor, that kind of thing. In other words, social energy, which is death by the minute or death by the by the uh, expenditure of calories and, and, and time, that social energy is being expended to uh, signify that the material bearer of values is important, right? So you're honoring and worshiping past death by engaging in ritual conduct that feeds, that sustains, that honors, that signifies, that realizes um, you know, the previous deaths that are embedded in, uh, or at least tethered in some way, 
to the objective value. So again, so let's just say that you've got a, a this is a, uh, a, a representation of a god, and it is people, you know, uh, again, kind of bowing down. This is someone bowing down. Sorry, that's the worst image I've ever seen of someone. Anyway, get a whole bunch of people bowing down or sacrificing uh, their goods or sacrificing their children or their cat or whatever to the god thing, right? That that is a signifier of, of worship, right? Okay, so ritual worship, sacrament, sacrifice, that social energy is what animates and energizes and keeps energized um, values, okay? So we know we have values when people die into them, and, and at core, that's what a social value is. It's always rooted in something called valor. All right, now that's to be distinguished then from economic value, which isn't quite the same. People die by the hour into its production, but it isn't honored and worshiped in the same way. And the crucial thing is that in a system of values, those who died in the establishment and in, in sacrifice to establish the values, and those who wish worship and honor with their social energy, those values are recognized. They get they get they get the demeanor of the God thing or the superior or looking back at them, right? So so the deference that's given is mutually recognized. What we're gonna find in capitalism is that those who work to produce value aren't recognized. And that Marx is going to tell us that, that there is an awful lot of value that's generated and created in capital that is not uh, recognized as something attached to, tethered to, belonging to, recognized by, by, by those who actually produced it. That the labor, that the energy, the social energy of those who died by the hour into the production of the thing disappear. They get paid a little bit on the, on, on called a wage or a salary, and that's on the other side, but they have no recognition in the, in the thing itself. So whatever it is that we, that we are looking at as a, as a, um, as a thing that had been a commodity being exchanged that had value. Um, this is my Honda minivan, I guess. Um, it is, is a, um, it, 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 the people who produced it, the people who designed it, the, all of that labor isn't recognized, right? I, as the owner, as the possessor, get it becomes a bit of a trophy for me. And at the moment that it's being exchanged, the person who, who owned the corporation had a legal title to that vehicle and then was able to profit from its sale, right? They were the ones who were recognized. So really fast. Um, right now, uh, Jeff Bezos, I believe, is the wealthiest man in the world. He owns Amazon or owns a huge chunk of Amazon Corporation, right? So all of the people who labor to make Amazon function, many of them are paid very poorly, have very few benefits. We know that there were very poor uh, coronavirus protections put in place. Um, so, and, and, and I don't believe it's, that there's unionization uh, in, in, in Amazon either. And so the people who produce the value of Amazon aren't recognized. Instead, Jeff Bezos, the owner, is recognized, right? And, 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 and there isn't a kind of mutual recognition going on here where those who produce the value, whose social energy goes into the production of the value, um, um, is recognized. And that's different from something like uh, a system of values where those who sacrifice uh, to at least to some degree, even if it's only as a slave, get some recognition back on the other side. I know it's a weird way to think about it, but we're going to go with that. Okay, so let's try to, so, so um, I want to try to set this up a little bit. I want to look in it. So I'm, I'm working on a, bec, uh, on a book called um, Economic Theology, the Religious Foundations of the Capital. I have this section on the Tierra del Fuegans. Um, so the tribal peoples of Tierra, Tierra del Fuego. So I, I've, I've got one of my favorite books um, about them here, The Uttermost Part of the Earth. Um, if you want to get a map out, I guess we could get a map out here and sort of that would look a lot better than my map, but it'll do. Yeah, here's, here's um, basically Tierra del Fuego is south of Patagonia. It's this whole region that's shared by both Chile and Argentina at the absolute tip, right? 
of, of, of South America. So here's Ames, here's uh, Mar-a-Lago, uh, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the presidential palace. And then down here, it, uh, again, below the tip of South America is Tierra del Fuego. So Antarctic um, Ocean uh, uh, not far away. So pretty rugged place, pretty difficult climate to live in. The Tierra del Fuegans, I'm going to just make, make the claim. So it's so really fast. Darwin went there. Other explorers had been there. Um, they, they, it, it's the scene of, of horrific genocide, a uh, hor horrible genocide, right? I mean, literally hunting down people um, for, for to protect sheep. It was an awful, awful place with a horrible uh, history. But the people who lived there were surprisingly um, um, successful, healthy, uh, well-nourished, and all that kind of thing, despite the fact that they had a very, uh, this is the way I want to put it here, a very spare, right? A very spare material culture, an astonishingly spare material culture. So really fast, the, the, the dwellings that they built, so we're, I mean, we're, we're talking almost like not, not quite Arctic conditions, but subarctic conditions. Um, yeah, the, the dwellings that they built were essentially um, wigwams without enclosure. Like I don't think any of them had enclosure, or very few of them did. Most of them were just sort of almost like windbreaks made out of twigs and uh, twigs and sticks uh, with some with some with some uh, like seal skins and stuff. They didn't have sewing, uh, so they really didn't have clothes. They just sort of draped seal skins sort of over them as a kind of blanket. Um, so even when they went hunting, they actually basically had to hold on to uh, to the to the skin um, that was draping over them because it wasn't fit as a as a garment, right? So, so no real clothes. So, so they're naked basically in Arctic or subarctic conditions, and this really astonished uh, uh, travelers, right? It's like it's like my, this was an astonishing thing to see, right? So, so they had no closed dwellings. They used fire that was their major technology. So Tierra del Fuego, the land of fire, right? It was the fires that were seen by um, by the European explorers who didn't understand a thing about them. That that's how they got their name. But but. But but they had so they had a very spare material culture. In other words, very little of their activity was um, rooted in sort of the production of material commodities. Right? I don't know that there was anything like a market or market exchange to speak of. Um, so production of goods and services that 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 were useful things. Um, right? They didn't die by the hour in the production of useful things. They didn't focus upon economic value in the modern sense. Instead, their entire life was essentially moral and social, that they sacrificed and, and, um, and you know, died by the hour, <laughs> as well as by the, the life itself, to honor the gods, to honor the group, you know, to, to, to engage in warfare and so on. So, yeah, so in the book, The Uttermost Part of the Earth, you get this description of the highly elaborate ritual culture so it's a world impoverished of economic value and of the commodities that would be produced in an economic way, but it is a cult, but it is a society that is rich in immaterial culture, and so um, they have these elaborate rituals uh, that include things like, uh, um, if I can find my examples here, yeah, that include things like, um, um, yeah, like. Um, yeah, so this is an, so this is a ritual scene. Um, I, sorry for the nudity. Sorry about that. And it is this. I mean, given what happened to these people, this is horrible to show. So I'm sorry about that. But this is this is not death. This is a ritual. This is snow on the ground that you're seeing. And yes, these people are naked, right? They really are. They their 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 clothing is spare, even at the best of times. And during these rituals, they 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 literally were entirely naked, right? And so they're laying in snow um, um, in, in, in a ritual sort of reenactment of a spiritual death of some kind. Um, and while that is going on, so, so this, this is sort of the boy's initiation ritual. Here's another uh, uh, ritual. I think this is for, uh, to call forth a storm or to fend off a storm. So again, like, like entirely naked, there's not snow on the ground here, but, but, but they're engaged in ritual content duct, right? So they're spending a lot of their time, and this is one of those non-enclosed dwellings, more of a windbreak than an actual sort of building, right? And again, we're in Arctic conditions, no clothes and no closed dwelling, right? 
And, and so, um, so instead of using your energy by the hour to produce useful things that are in an exchange and you get money or something, this group is instead using their time and their energy to generate social life, ritual, and so on, right? So, so these men are engaged in a, um, uh, in a ritual um, to, I, I believe it's, it's, it's for storms. Um, and I think this is this is either the same thing or an initiation ritual. I'm sorry, it's been a while since I, I read the book. But but the um, yeah, so so I think these are women. This is men, and the men are engaged in again in this in this ritual conduct. So it's cold here, and you could uh, wear clothing uh, that's been produced as value, or you could engage in ritualized behavior uh, values. And um, we're going to get to the line here in just a minute. But here we have, so, so um, there's a couple of images. During these initiation rituals, is very elaborate, the kind of uh, painting that goes on. There's an assumption of different personas, um, you know, men in the tribe. Again, like, like, like the interesting thing is, is apparently uh, at one point, um, like, like what you would do is you would get like, like a supply of whale built up or a supply of, of meat of a kind built up. And these rituals would sometimes last an entire year. That, that, that you'd almost like you'd have this mask, right? You're in Gotham terms again, where you're generating a virtual social mask, but you're animating that mask for like a year at a time. In other words, the ritual life was so extensive that you would drop out of first life production of, of you know, goods and, 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 and um, you know, other things to engage in this elongated second life of sacred activity. And, and religious ritual. So instead of warming yourself with clothes, these people here are being warmed, we'll say, uh, through the participation in value. So it isn't the material object with value that is providing them with uh, the needs of life. It is the immaterial generation of values and of conduct that's structured by values, right? That's providing them with the needs of life. Um, so yeah, here's some more of the uh, images of the um, ritualized, um, um, you know, almost totemic. I, I don't think it is actually technically totemic, but it's it, it's these ghost-like um, um, uh, um, ritual, uh, um, you know, costumes and, and so on that are that are worn. Here's an um, image of hunting. Uh, so again, like the travelers were astonished that they would go out, swim, hunt. Um, in cold and spray and you know freezing temperatures with no clothing on to speak of just again these blankets that were wrapped around them um and get more images that are actually on chilean um uh, stamps um and here's another image of, of one of these rituals again of of uh again you're not warmed even the women here are relatively unclosed so you're not warmed with with the um utility of an object of value Instead, you're warming yourself with the social life that is honoring and worshiping values, okay? So the needs of life are being met that way. Here's another image again of these, uh, of these men engaged in this uh, uh, initiation ritual. Okay, so in, in my book, I've got a section about this. And, and so like the, the, the idea is, again, like, like I, I distrust a lot of, this, um, of these accounts um, you know, again, this is a, the scene of a horrific genocide. So it's it, you, I, I mourn even talking about this group. Um, you, you get so angry reading about it. it, it it's 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 very it's a difficult read actually. But um, but there was something about the about the Fuegans that was very interesting. That they essentially they were warmed not by clothing of value or by object of value or by a, a dwelling of value. They were warmed instead by the collective effervescence. And that's a term from Durkheim that we'll talk about later. But 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 the fever, the collective fever, the more, the energy, right, generated by the participation of rituals that were circulating by and structured by values. Okay, so these this ritual life then, which could last a year at a time and, and lasted a significant portion of time, warmed them. Right, so they were huddled and warmed. You know, so so again, instead of donning parkas. They warmed each other at the fire of their own uh, uh, ritual order, right? So again, that's a bit of an exaggeration and, and that kind of thing. But but again, that is a world of values, of values. 
All right, now we're going to go into Marx, where Marx is going to tell us where something happens in modern society. It's rooted in value, okay? And that social life itself becomes reconstructed, and that the old system of values that, that were um, essentially um, constituted society from the first, um, you know, pre historic, you know, tribal peoples or, or clan peoples or horde peoples of, of, you know, the Paleolithic era, you know, the values that people were willing to die for, the, you know, the memories of the ancestors, the, the, the you know, the, the, those initial sort of uh, 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 sensibilities of gods and, and, and animalistic totems and so on, that all of that is reconstructed and that we're only, honestly, we're like 250 or 300 years into this process. And there are about half of the people in capitalism right now are, are within, what, like three generations of having been part of a society that was fundamentally about values, not value. In other words, a revolution of social life has taken place. An entirely new kind of society, if you even want to call it that, has come into existence. And it has, it, and, and, and we... As sociologists, I mean, this is this is what we should be doing with our lives is trying to figure out what it means to have a society that's penetrated by, that's shattered by the pursuit of surplus value instead of a society that's structured around the ritual honoring and feeding and animation and energizing of values. What does it mean when we're not, again, honoring our values and our gods, but are instead generating profit and being fed into machines and offices and technologies that that uh, that generate profit okay i think i'm going to um stop this here and um we'll, we'll do the hegel section separately okay thank you i hope you found this useful